Hi, I'm Garrett with IDC Woodcraft. I'm glad you've come to this video. If you've purchased the one inch surfacing bit off of the IDC Woodcraft store, then this video is going to tell you how to set up the feeds and speeds so they are set up properly in your CNC router tool library and your design software. Now, if you are brand new to CNC routers and you're wondering what a surfacing bit is and what it's used for, there are two reasons you use the surfacing bit, and the first one is the most important, and why you'll use it as your first bit when you get your CNC router. You see, most CNC routers, when they come in, the motion of the gantry is not exactly parallel to the bed or the work project area. And most beginners don't realize this. They put a project down, they clamp it down, they start working on it, and then they find out that one part of the project is cut too deep, and the other part is not like almost not cut at all. Well, that's because the spoil board is not parallel to the motion of the router. So basically, your project is clamped like that, your router moves on a plane like that. So you need to work out that deviation in your machine. There's another reason, sometimes the spoil boards are warped and you need to work out that warp. Here's how a warp causes a problem. When you clamp a project down on a warp, you are warping your project. And then you cut all the stuff on it, it looks beautiful, you pull it off and now it's warped. It doesn't fit the way you wanted it to fit and whatever else you were doing with it. So you have to get your spoil board surfaced. The other reason you'll use a surfacing bit is to recondition a warped piece of board or a, a botched job so you can reuse it. So you don't have to throw it in the fire pit and get some nice fire out of it. Especially if it's a nice piece of walnut or oak or mahogany, something like that. So that's what a surfacing bit is for and why you want to have it in your arsenal, why you have to have it in your arsenal. Okay, so feeds and speeds, what are they? The speeds is the actual rotation of your spindle in RPMs, revolutions per minute. This is really important. If you have an RPM that's set way too high for this type of bit, well, for any bit, every bit has its own feeds and speeds, but let's just say you're set too high, what you're going to do is burn out the bit corner really quick. You're going to get it really hot and it's going to start to roll over. You're going to lose your sharp edge. So the spindle speed can't be too high. On the same token, it can't be too low where it's gouging out much more than it's built for as far as material that it's cutting. So that's what speeds are. Now feeds is the rate of speed at which the bit is moving through the material. It's usually in uh, inches per minute or millimeters per second. Those are the two industry standards. If a feed rate is up too high, it's going through the material too fast, then what can happen is you're overloading the bit again, you're bogging your machine down because it's having to work really hard to get through it, and you can actually overload your machine where it stops running. If the feed is too slow, now you're starting to rub your cutting edges on the material and that's going to burn it out really fast as well. So the combination of feeds and speeds are really critical. So that's what this video is going to do. It's going to take the happy medium between really hard woods and soft woods and we're going to set it up. So it's going to be a little bit conservative but not too conservative. Now if you don't have a surfacing bit, you can get this bit off of the IDC Woodcraft site. There's a link down below. You just come back to this video and set up your tool library for it. But what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the Vectric software. Now, if you don't have Vectric, it doesn't matter. Whether you're using Easel, Carbide Create, Fusion 360, Carveco, they all have the same settings in it because they're machining softwares that have this type of information that's required. So just follow along with what I'm doing, find your fields in your software, and plug this data in. So without further ado, Let's dive into the Vectric software and set this up exactly the way you need to set it up to get the best life out of this bit. Let's go. So before we start in the Vectric, I just want to give you the specifications of the bit. This is it right here, a close-up. This is considered an end mill in technical terms. It has three flutes, one, two, three, or three cutting edges. Each flute has a cutting ability of a quarter of an inch. That's the height of the flute. Each flute on this bit is a carbide tip brazed to a steel body. The body is made of 1045 steel, which is a hard, high carbon steel. And it has a coating on it to uh, prevent it 
from oxidation and it's a heat absorbing coating. And then the shank is a quarter inch. The overall length of the bit is one and a half inches. Okay, so we are going to go into Vectric. And I've been making this little cool plaque. Jeep, need I say more? For you Jeep lovers, you get it. In Vectric, you want to be in your toolpath area. Now, that's going to be the same with all softwares. You just want to find out where your router bit settings are. And it's typically, if you have a cam section in your software, it's going to be in the toolpath area. Uh, things like ESOL, Carbide, Create, you can access it through the upper menus. So when you're in the toolpath area, there's going to be a little icon here. It is called Design Tool, a Display Tool Database, and it has a picture of three router bits. Select that. And you're going to bring up a box that has all your router bits in the library and all their settings. So since this bit is considered an end mill, we're just going to select end mill right here, highlight it, and then we're going to come down to the bottom right here and click plus. And it's going to insert a bit right in to the end mill tree. Now, the first thing I want you to see is it automatically populated it as a ball nose. So we're immediately going to change that to end mill. Click the drop down, select end mill, and it changes over here. It says end mill up here. It says end mill over here. Now, one of the things we want to do is modify the name. Now, you see how this came in as surfacing? That's because I had to practice on the video, so it defaulted to that. Normally, this would come in looking like this. So I'm just going to fix that and say OK. So normally it's going to populate, it's going to say end mill, it'll give some kind of size. Usually it's the last bit that you selected when you did a toolpath. And so you're going to select this little button to the left of the title of the bit. And that's going to open up a little dialog box. Do not erase this blue area. That blue area is what's setting up the name of the bit, where it says end mill and then a quarter of an inch. The data that you put in is going to change the name of all this stuff. What we are going to do is add to the name. So we're going to just click off to the right side. So our cursor is to the right, and we're going to give it a space, and we're going to type in surfacing and select OK. And so now it's been given the name surfacing. Now, just below this, there's a field. And that field gives is for your reference. So, for example, you bought the, the bit from the IDC Woodcraft store. Then you can just put in here www.idcwoodcraft.com. And now you'll know the source of the bit if you have to replace it. And most bits eventually do have to replace them because no bit lasts forever. <laughs> okay, so the next field is inches. If you're working in inches or millimeters, uh, we are working in inches. So we're going to stay in inches. The bit diameter is going to be 1.0. And then down here we want to say the number of flutes. And we're going to say 3. So right here, there's a D. I just got to go back to this for a minute. Where it says diameter, there's a D next to it. That D is referenced right here. So if you're wondering what information it's wanting from what, you can always go over to the image and see what they're calling out for the little letter, letter designations. Okay, so we have all the basic information in. We are going to press Create Settings. We select that, and then it auto-populates with some information that we're going to change. <coughs> So the first one we want to change is the pass depth. Now, I'm going to explain what the pass depth is. When a router bit comes in, it's going to come down to a certain depth and start to cut across. You can dictate what that depth is as a default, which is what we're going to do right now. That's the pass depth. For this bit, which is a quarter inch tall, we are going to go with half the height of it so our pass depth, or its depth of cut per pass, will be an eighth of an inch. So when we go back into the router bit library, we're going to change that to 0.125. So that's our pass depth. On the subject of pass depths, 
there's another really crucial factor that I need to explain to you. I'm going to do that at the end of this. It's the direction that your bit is rotating while it's moving through the cut. Not like counterclockwise or forward clock, uh, clockwise, but something called conventional milling versus Klein milling. You absolutely want to use conventional milling when you're using this bit. I'll explain this at the end of this video. So let's just keep going and then we'll get to that. Now the step over for this bit is going to be a little unusual for what you may be used to if you've been setting bits up. We want to go to a 70%. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to take full advantage of what the bit is designed to do. We're going to go back over here and we're going to come up here. This bit is designed to remove a lot of material around a wide area of a surface. And so you want to take maximum advantage of that and use the, the majority of the cutting ability of the bit. Some people don't like to use this, especially when they're doing a spoil board. Some people like to do very narrow passes. What I would suggest if you're going to do that, stick around 30% of a step over. I would go with 70%. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to change that to 70% like we did. And then comes the RPM. So RPMs for this bit will be about 13,000 RPM. Now when it comes to RPM, when you have a spindle on your CNC router, that's very easy to set. But when you have a manual router, that would be like a Makita or a DeWalt that has a little adjustment dial on it, then it's more of a guessing game. The best way to do that is turn it up to full speed and then bring it down about a fifth or a sixth of the full rotation of the knob. And that'll get you about the right spindle speed. Hope that made sense. All right, let's keep going. And then you have the feed rate. Now this is designed to move quite quickly. And so with this feed rate, you want to set it to 100. Now the plunge rate is something you want to have uh, quite a bit of caution on. Don't ever make it like more than 10. So just set it to 10. The plunge rate is the rate that the bit, let me set this up, plunges down into the material before it starts its cutting pass. A word of caution. A surfacing bit is not designed to plunge into material. It's designed to plunge down beside the material and then start to move across. So you want to always keep that in mind. Don't plunge directly into the material. If you are, make sure you use a long ramp in your settings, in your toolpath settings, when you set up the toolpath for that bit. By long ramp, I mean at least the diameter of the bit, I would probably go to twice the diameter of this bit. In fact, I will say go to twice the diameter of the bit because there is a wide area here that does not do any cutting. And if this is coming down at the diameter of the bit, it's, it's going to go too deep, too fast, and it's going to start to rub in this area, and that's going to cause a lot of stress in your z-axis. So always go twice the diameter of the ramp when you are moving this bit into the material like this. Again, I just got to say it again. These are not designed to plunge into material. They're designed to come down beside the material and then move sideways and start as cut that way. So your feed rate would be 100. Your plunge rate, make it 10. Tool number is only relevant if you have a tool changer on your machine, and if you do, then you are probably pretty well versed at what I'm doing here anyway. So now we have all our data in here, and now we are just going to come over and click Apply. And when I apply that bit, it is now populated in the database. It says over here, 1 inch surfacing bit and mill. Right here it says the same thing, end mill one inch surfacing. And now when we do a toolpath, we can select that bit and our settings are going to be good. There's one other thing I didn't explain here, is the feed units. There are two standards in the industry. 
for CNC machines. It would be inches per minute and millimeters per second. You want to make sure that, that is set up accordingly. If you're in inches, set it for inches per minute. Everything I'm doing is in inches per minute. If you want to work in metrics, you'll come up here, change things to millimeters, and then convert all the numbers to metrics. For example, a one inch diameter bit is going to be 25.4 millimeters. What this software doesn't do is convert these numbers when you switch this over here. So you're going to have to switch over to metrics and enter your data in that way and then apply. Now the metric data will be available down below in the description box along with the inch data for this bit. There's one other thing I want to explain to you that's really important. I have to apply that and say okay. And that is what I was uh, warned you about before. It's something called Klein milling versus conventional milling. So before I get into that, let's go over to the tool path of this one. And I'll explain to you where this shows up. So let's say we are going to do a pocket. I'm sorry, a profile. Select that. Down in the machine vectors, you have a button called climb and a button called conventional. This is where these selections come in. It also shows up in pocket milling, where you'll have climb and conventional right there. So let's go back to this drawing and talk about it. So to set the stage, we are looking down on the material. It's like we're looking through the router at the router bit this is the material, this is the router bit, this is the direction it's traveling. And the rotation direction, of course, is clockwise. So it's spinning something like that. Not quite off-center like that, but it's spinning like that. So as it's spinning, it is moving in this direction, like that. The router as it's making its cut, it's starting a shear cut right here, and that shear cut is increasing in thickness as it's coming around. The entire cut is called chip load, and I'm not going to explain what chip load is. Uh, that's going to be calculated when you set up these uh, feeds and speeds. So when this is moving in that direction, and the cut is starting from the cut edge, we're going to say this is the cut edge, this is the uncut edge, because the bit is starting this cut right here. The router is essentially pulling it into the cut. Because it's moving in like that, it doesn't want to go, so the router has to pull it as it's, the bit is turning. What it's doing is taking something out of the machine called backlash. All machines have a certain degree of play in them or looseness or sloppiness and so when it is running you want to make sure that you are set up so this bit will be cut in like that this is called conventional cutting where the bit is coming in along the cut edge and working its way like that and i'm going to explain to you why that is so important especially with this bit so here is a reverse image. The bit is still going in the same direction and is still spinning in the same direction. Like that. The bit is actually trying to climb out of the material because it's hitting its start point right here. And so it wants to bounce out. And you are going to get a bit of what they call chatter on the surface. And that chatter is not good. Now, this is considered climb cutting because essentially the bit is climbing up this surface right here. When you're cutting 70% step over, it's not so bad. You won't have a lot of problem with it. However, let me just select this again. Some people want to go with a 30% step over. So let's just say a 30% is about that much. 
Now the bit is literally trying to crawl along that surface. You're going to get a lot of force going off in this direction. The bit is going to bounce a lot. And it's going to try to drag itself forward, taking out the back the backlash. So it basically backlash is slop back and forth, and it's the bit is going to bounce back and forth, and it's going to leave your surfaces really bad. And in a bit like this, it can literally grab that edge of the material and pull it, force the machine to back out, just by virtue of the force of the router, and yanking it off in that direction. That's climb milling. So with a bit like this, do not use climb milling, use conventional milling. So the climb and conventional, there are some other tool paths in the Vectric software that use the climb and conventional, if I remember correctly. So you just want to keep your eye out for that and how that works. So I hope I explained that enough to you. Give me a thumbs up if I did. As far as the surfacing bit goes, the settings for that are down in the description as well. I've converted them to millimeters. And if you don't have that bit, there's a link to get that from the IDC website. And then you just come back to this video and plug in the data that's here in this video. I uh, will be doing a video that has all the feeds and speeds for all the bits that are typically used for home-based CNC routers. Because a lot of people want that information. If you're brand new to CNC routers, subscribe. Because I give you all the basics and all the basics in routers and design and help you along the way. Take your email questions. Sometimes I'll even get on the phone with you. And I think that's about it. I'd love to hear a comment from you down below. Any corrections and a thumbs up. That's it. This is Garrett with IDC Woodcraft. I hope you have a great day, better tomorrow, and happy CNC. I'll talk to you later.